Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast. My name is Dane Grunewald, CEO of the Huddle3 Group. And today I have Marsha Dashko joining me. Marsha is the CEO of Marsha Dashko and Associates and also the author of Pivot, Disrupt and Transform. So a lot of exciting topics to, uh, to be walking through today. Welcome, Marsha. Thank you very much. What a pleasure it is to be here. Oh, it's a buzz. The, the conversation we were having before the show was just so high octane. Um, so th this is going to be a fun half hour, 40 minutes. Perhaps for the benefit of our listeners, you could give us a, a snapshot of, you know, who you are, how you came to be so passionate and such an expert in, in this space. I'm a natural teacher. I think I learned that ever since I was a, a, a little kid and, and growing up in I, uh, the snowy winters in Iowa, I would grab my little brothers and sisters and say, okay, you're students, I'm the teacher. So away we would go. So that has evolved. Um, uh, my first career was in corporate communications and marketing. And then I started working for a small uh, consulting firm owned by Dr. Perry Dluckman, who was great friends with Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Mm -hmm. They were management consultants. And Perry taught me and helped corporate or business teams learn and apply Dr. Deming's philosophy of management. And Dr. Deming had been invited after World War II to, by General MacArthur to go to Japan and help Japan become a global competitor. Mm -hmm. That's what they did. Then he came back, worked with the CEOs of Ford and General Motors, and then began to spread his philosophy you know, across North America and as far in the world as we could. Um, so long story short, then I, the two of them mentored me. I attended 20 of Dr. Deming's four-day workshops, co-founded the Bay Area Deming User Group and the Into and Thinking um, organization. And we met monthly for about 16, 17 years. Wow. And, and then we had Into and Thinking for 17 years. And we had annual conferences. And this is so it's the foundation. Dr. Deming taught a philosophy of leadership and management. And people think, oh, he's the quality circles guy, he's TQM, he's all of these things, Six Sigma, and he's not. He he gave a foundation of about leadership transformation with a focus on quality, continual improvement, innovation. And it's all about. The relationships, the quality of everything, not just products and services, but the relationships and the communication that you have, yep. and essentially the leadership thinking. If you got get that wrong, you're going down a slippery slope. It's that's a really neat space to be into so early on, before a lot of the tech changes that came through and making things like pivots, you know, fashionable because. Clearly, that's what Deming and, and a lot of your work was, was coming in and helping companies think about uh, embracing different ways of, of growing businesses, transforming businesses and products. Exactly. And yeah. it takes two things. It takes what, what I've seen over the decades. It takes an openness and a commitment to learning, thinking yeah. that I don't have all the answers. I'm not the greatest leader I can be. There's more that I need to develop about myself and inspire and develop in my organization. So that's yeah. number one. And if that, if that commitment to continual learning doesn't exist, I, I can't help. Yeah. Secondly, courage. It takes courage to apply this new thinking because it challenges the management fads, the trends, the buzzwords, the yeah. quote unquote best practices that have infiltrated so many of our organizations and broken our systems. We see broken systems in education, in healthcare, in corporations, yeah. in nonprofits. That has to that has to transform. It's got to pivot and transform, or like Dem Dr. Deming said, America will decline. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because you do see, I read a great article the other day on Boeing. When I say the other day, it was probably a year ago, okay. <laughs> time blurs, but it was talking about how Boeing's been one of the leading organizations in aerospace and R&D and that they were slipping, they were sliding. A lot of the best talent was leaving Boeing. And 
and to to your point you just shared on Deming's view um, if you don't unlock the potential of teams if you don't invite them to come up with better ideas than you do this whole openness and commitment to learning this courage to not be the one with all of the ideas businesses die economies suffer with with a lack of innovation and, and stagnation so I, I think it's it's true it's it's clearly true it's proven and it's continued to be proven over time yes one of our um our our major sponsor when we started in into and thinking network down in southern california <clears throat> at Canoga park was um boeing they were right. our sponsor for many years for our annual conference and then over time they were bought several times and the more they yeah. were bought the less they were interested in uh transforming but um yeah i remember some of the greatest <clears throat> executives at boeing and <clears throat> their commitment to learning and for example um one of them an executive from boeing left and went to be the ceo of ford Al alan malaley and uh -huh. When he first got there, the first thing he did was he went out and listened and listened and listened to his people, his customers, and his car dealers because they were the closest people to the end customer. Yeah. And what were their issues? And I was so impressed with that when I saw what he was doing because that is a true sign of leadership is when... Yeah. That people get out of their office, and I remember working with um, one of the largest school bus companies in the nation in Georgia, and I was talking to the executive assistant one day, and she was so frustrated because she said, I'm always having to go out and find that CEO. He's always out on the manufacturing floor, <laughs> the assembly floor, and sure enough, that's where he was. But it was a good thing, clearly, because he was- Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, because you- you have your pulse really yeah. on what is going on in the organization. And I, I remember when I was long ago, I worked for FMC in Minnesota yeah. and we had 4,000 employees and I felt like, well, they fi finally gave me a title of special projects because I think they didn't know what to do with me, but I was always out with the people to learn and I was doing a lot of the projects and writing and writing the president's speeches and things like that. So I had to, I had, I felt like I, I had to listen first. Yeah. And I was shy. No, I was shy back then. So um, it was easy for me to do. And it's hard being thrust into some of those environments and listening if you don't have the the deep knowledge of the product or the service or how they're using your product or service. But, but in some ways, going back to your point on courage, having the ability to go out there and say, look, my role is, is to make this product, this service, this team as powerful as it can be for you. Tell me what you're seeing. Tell me what we're missing. It, it ties into this theme that we're seeing a lot of in social media right now about the three most powerful words being, I don't know, and, yes. and, and leaders needing to embrace those three words. Yes. And can you help me understand? I and like that. That's, that's a, another powerful one. One of my first clients was a president of a chain of car dealerships. Mm -hmm. And I asked him when I asked him to go out and find out what was going on in his organization. And every morning at 10 o'clock, he would go out and walk and listen. And he yeah. would talk to his people and he would get to know them really as person, the family, everything, the work, what are the barriers, how can I help, uh, on and on. And I had already done this, right? Uh, my phase one when I'm working with an organization is to assess. And I'm out and I talk to every possible person I can and really get the overview. So I have a good understanding. So it, got, it kind of pushed him out the door. So yeah. the, a month later, I go back to work with him. And I said, how's that going? And he said, oh, Marsha, I don't like this. I said, really? Why is that? He, he said, I'm just not used to the, this. I said, are you doing it? Because oftentimes if they don't like doing something, they stop. They'll stop. Right? Yes. Yeah. And he said, oh, yes. I go out every morning, 10 o'clock. I go out for at least 30 minutes, sometimes an hour. 
And I said, really? So you don't like doing it, but you do it. Why is that? He said, oh my gosh. He said, I learned so much. I'm never going to stop. Yeah. And he, it was, he was out of his comfort zone because he's kind of a quiet guy, kind of an introverted kind of person. But he was learning so much. Then, then a few months later, and he was still doing it, maybe not every day, but often. And he said, now, Marsha, the problem is it's very hard for me to get from my car into the office because everybody wants to talk to me. <laughs> and he said, it's very, it's very comfortable now. But yeah. he said... You know, they want to tell me everything that's going on, good and bad and the family. And It's a big role. And it's interesting. You, you mentioned on a podcast of yours that I was listening to the other day, the Change Podcast, that uh, leaders need to stop and think about the value of their teams. If you're hiring a thousand people or a hundred thousand people and you're paying them these salaries, like what? what are you relying on them to bring to you? And And actually, even if it's not bringing to you, where are you? where can you rely on their talents and their passions to lead the organization? You know, there might be things that happen outside of your purview too. Have you, have you seen that phenomenon, uh, you know, when it comes to innovation and really changing direction? Have you seen that phenomenon with any customers in recent times, you know, coming through COVID where there's, there's been a real shift from the, the fringes of a team or, or you know, not the, the central leadership group? Huge shifts, huge shifts, because. Um... Yes, the if there are going to be pivots, and I've written articles about this, the cover articles for the Silicon Valley Business Journal, for example, about innovation and pivoting and and how the the for example, the pandemic demanded that people pivot. They either are gonna thrive and survive or they're not. So we saw that with organizations such as the car manufacturers becoming ventilator assemblers, right? Mm -hmm. And then we had um, beer breweries um, creating the hand sanitizers. So yeah. another pivot. So, and the key with all these pivots that were able to happen, I said one day to a team, I was talking to a healthcare team and they, and I said, well, like Louis Vuitton makes high-end luxury handbags, et cetera. And they pivoted during that time to make uh, the, the gowns and the masks and everything yeah. that we needed in the healthcare world. And so all of these pivots come about, but it means it can take one person or one, one executive team, one idea yeah. to say, here is a need. It's a brand new need. We've never seen it before. These are the skills we have. We can shift our focus. We can shift our aim and our purpose temporarily or maybe for good. Maybe we're creating a new market. Yeah. We're going to pivot. But once we, they have that aim, then they need to communicate it. It's powerful that they have to communicate to everyone on the team. They pull the team together. They say, here is our aim. By what method? What's the strategy? How can you contribute to make this come about? Yes. So this is the result. We need to make millions of ventilators or millions of masks and gowns or millions of something services. How can we work together to accomplish this? And then step back. Don't tell the teams what to do, but yeah. where can they contribute? It's get out of the way of your people because uh -huh. they will take you where you've never been before. Oh, I and, like that. And in that pivot, through that disruption, the organization, the people, and then the organization transforms. And that's the title of the book, Pivot, Disrupt, Transform. And it's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be easy. But it's going to be so invigorating, so self-satisfying, so meaningful. And, and I think I'm going to repeat that. So get out of the way of your people because they're going to take you where you've never been before. That's 
it, it resonates with me because we're, we've come through this great resignation. As you said, through COVID, a number of companies did some vast pivots and, and really scaled into new markets and new products. Uh, but we've also seen people leaving because they don't feel like they have a good relationship with their boss, their coworkers, their company's purpose, um, because they don't feel like they're being empowered to grow. You talked about growth earlier, uh, or that they're working with a team that's actually, you know, energized to do something together, to solve problems together. A lot of people felt, I think, in COVID that they were just stuck in their role doing their small piece. Um, so maybe you could touch on uh, where you saw that the relationships, that human connection um, to help, you know, embrace, uh, embrace that whole growth mindset and, and, you know, achieve some of those shifts. Yes. So I think that leaders sometimes forget that one of their major roles is to develop their people, develop their teams. They don't yeah. give them the time or the commitment in the education. Um, they don't give them the time to build the team. They don't give them the, the education in order to develop the, the teamwork and, and to teach them what, it, what are the what are the parts of teamwork? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's about relationships. It's about communication. It's about, uh, there are a lot of tools that working together, they can, they can um, problem solve together, for example. They can improve processes. But if the leaders say, oh, we don't have the budget, well, it's like, okay, the, if you want to cut the budget, cut, 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 just... No fastest way to cut your budget is to put the close sign on your door. Yeah. And then shut down the website because yeah. if you're not going to invest in your people, then you, you are, that tells me immediately you're not a leader because yeah. that's the major responsibility of leadership is to invest in your people, create the workplace where they are self-motivated and contribute can contribute because a lot of leaders also think, oh, I have to motivate my people. I have to incentivize my people. That is the worst things that you can absolutely do. Plus, yeah. you will demotivate them. And you mentioned um, empower the word empower, and I'm going to yank that word away out of your vocabulary because yeah. empowering is giving permission to people. And that is not your job as a leader. Your job huh. is to create the workplace so that people feel they have power with and you, with their colleagues, with you as the leaders, so that you don't have power over. The leader's job is to have better control of the business. That's what everyone seeks is better control of their of their organization, but they yes. do it with the people. They do it with their teams. And over time, teams become self-organizing. Once the leaders have invested in them and given them um, opportunities to come together as teams and work together and learn together, it's learn together, work together, improve together, innovate together. If they have those four things, and that is part of transformational change. Some organizations want to stay stuck. They want to problem solve yeah. and they want to improve processes. Those things happen in, a, in their boxes. They will make some improvement, but the big challenges and problems that they face will never change if they don't transform themselves, their thinking, their leadership, and their teams and organizations, and they do it, they need to do it all the way through the organization. So that's why I work with an executive team. Yeah. But then the minute, you know, I've had so many team leaders, CEOs or presidents say to me after their two-day education, Marsha, everybody in the organization has to go through this because it's a different, it's different thinking, it's different vocabulary, it's different um, the mindset, the different um, processes, different tools. And I teach them that in two days. Wow. Uh, if they have intensive, complex um, problems, maybe I, I'll suggest a three-day um, mm -hmm. 
education session. But then, and then monthly we do a refresh, refresh, refresh. But then if they take that through the organization, that education, and they invest in it, then the you were mentioning the relationships, the mm-hmm. connections, the they learn what's important. And most people are leaving. There's a lot of things we need to teach, like um, work ethics and you know giving two week notice or yeah. you know thing. There's there's things that are not being taught, whether it's at home or you know this commitment to work, whether at yeah. at home or at school. Uh, whatever people are just ready to just oh I don't like this. I'm done. I'll, I'll walk. I'll walk away. And they just and half of them ghost or not half, but people ghost too. But when people learn, and I think some of that training, um, leaders in the workplace are going to have to begin there. They're going to have to begin to teach the young people about commitment to work, quality yeah. to work, dedication to work, not just get it done the fastest, oh, slap it together and push it out. Where do you have quality? Did you meet the customer needs? Things like that. They, they just, they're, it, they're not always thinking about that. Yeah. But the relationships, I think, are developed, too, when there's the two-way communication, there's clarity of purpose, Mm -hmm. and there's, and what I'm seeing, though, a lot is people leave when they are never appreciated. They never get a thank you. They, I I mean, how hard is it to, even if it's Zoom uh, or I or um, an email saying thank you. That way, I really appreciated you stepping up to take care of that customer. Whatever it is, where is the appreciation? Yeah. And if people felt, if people felt appreciated and recognized for the work that they're doing, it will become contagious, and yeah. will get more and more and more healthy relationships in the workplace versus the toxic relationships or the dysfunctional ones and uh, dysfunctional organizations. And we have so much potential. We, we do have a lot of so potential. many opportunities. What's interesting, I like the way that you yanked uh, empower from my vocabulary because that's been one of my go-to words. I thought I was well, very sorry. progressive with that. But, <laughs> but I like the way you did it because you said that's too micro. I like the way you explained that that's giving permission to people, which would suggest that it's a very paternalistic, it's, it's author- authoritarian. Um, yes. and, and so this whole power with rather than power over, I've, I've spoken to some of our guests about that before, read about it a little bit. Yes. It seems to be more about leaders creating the environment rather than this is how we're going to run a meeting or this is how we're going to give each other appraisals and feedback, or here's the new app that lets us give kudos to each other. It's, it's creating that environment, creating that work culture where people can be in these teams that become more self-organizing. Is that a fair reflection? There's, there's so many things I want to speak to in your in your uh, words there. Please. Um, and I, I want to also give a shout out to Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer over at Stanford. He talked, and one of his books is about uh, communication and the power with and power over concept. I might have picked that up from him or I I know he talks about it. So he's, so he's the one I'm giving credit to at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So I would like to hear you talk a little bit more about what you just said so I can kind of take. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm getting the sense that it's not about how a leader creates a team that's going to chase innovation or creates a continuous improvement group or writes new policies. It's more about how they create an environment where people can feel uh, that the team is given opportunity, not through permission, but they're in fact, they're, that's what they're hired to do. You, you're being hired to come in and learn with us and raise your hand when you see something that could be done better because that's not how most organizations work. Right, um, right. So, so is that is, when you do your two-day workshop and your monthly check-ins, is it more about changing that? environment of, of how people work together rather than putting in more rigid processes and checklists? Yes. I mean, 
you do, the organizations definitely have process improvement teams. They have innovation teams. Some of them are called like sprinter teams. Or, yeah. Yeah, but it's, um, uh, there's one organization that I started working with and they had lots of problems, lots of dysfunction, not really a management team pulled together, even though they were multi-million dollar company. And so he pulled together that, that team and began the work. And so they were under $50 million. They went to a couple of $200 million, I think. And that was just almost the cleanup, creating the foundation, having the process improvement teams and doing some problem solving and connecting with customers and looking at the data and making better decisions. That was the first part. Then we then we when that was stable mm -hmm. and people could say oh um you know here's an issue i need a few people together with me to work on improving that process or we need a system here or whatever so i asked them for you know their improvement ideas more and more improvement ideas and then one day they had an offsite um sale they were selling their products yeah and I said, okay, I'm going to bring in some people from the outside who don't know any of you. And I brought in a TV producer, uh, a president of a company outside of their industry. Mm -hmm. And at the time, my son, who was, I'm going to, I think he was 15 or 16 years old at the time. Yep. And so there were, all the employees were there. Customers were go coming and going all day from eight in the morning till two in the afternoon. And I said to the three people, I want you to talk, talk to the employees as you can, observe, take notes like crazy, write down every idea you can think of to improve this process, and also talk to the customers. So they did. And at this time, the leadership team and the employees thought, we're pretty good. We are making money hand over fist. Yeah. And... There's not much more we can improve. So that was a Saturday. On Monday, I walked into the management team meeting with over 300 ideas Whoa. from the three people about how to improve. And the management team just, they were blown away. Then we created the innovation system. Okay. And the, so we took a lot of these ideas and went through them and yes some were improvement ideas some were in process and some were totally innovative they had never thought of them right so we created that new system and it took them a hun another hundred million that's a big lift yeah so yeah that organization grew times 10 but they had the foundation so they could do it pretty rapidly yeah and they never believed in the jobs all done it's yeah. continual improvement. It's continually thinking, what else? What's different? What's bold? What's what's something that that customers wouldn't even ask ask for? Because how could they know? Yeah. And when when those teams go about paring down that list of three hundred ideas into the let's say the three biggest innovative prospects, how how do you set the team? Are you picking a, a, like a tiger team or, or like you said earlier, a sprinter team that's, you know, cross-functional is going to come together and work on this a hundred percent of the time, or is it borrowing from people like Google do with their 20% projects? What, what's your view on what works best in, in, in getting those teams energized to, to come together and think about where they're going to take the business or the product? I've, I've seen it multiple ways, different <clears throat> ways work with different companies. We kind of start out with um, identifying some of those natural out-of-the-box thinkers um, and asking them if they want to be part of the team. Sometimes the executive team know of people that they for sure want on the team. And then <clears throat> an, an important part is to open it up. And So you make it so, open. Yes. So it's every, it might be every week, every two weeks, once a month. And oftentimes it's led by the president of the company. He, he or she might be the team leader. But whenever they come together, um, 
and if they have a, a, a list or they create their list, they, they're, um, they're open, they're, they're bold in their thinking, they're okay with really questioning back and forth. They yeah. don't think, take things personally as, you know, it, well, hopefully people don't say that's a stupid idea, but yeah. they ask more. We've seen it before. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us more about that idea and how yeah. do you think it would work and so forth. Because, uh, but I will say that most of the time, the team members in general will shut their own ideas down faster than anyone else. I remember yeah. um, decades ago, one of my first clients was PBS, and um, the senior vice president of operations who brought me in was a very progressive thinker and great leader, very well respected by his organization and in the industry. And he had, he had a meeting and he was asking for improvement ideas what to, to make the organization better and so forth. And it was very interesting. People were shooting down their own ideas. Some young families were asking if they could have a daycare center on site. Right. And someone said, no, we can't do that because of this, this, and this. He said, why not? He said, if you want something and it's a win-win for all, he said, do your research. Yeah. Make a plan. Give me a proposal. Let me know what it will cost and what we need to do to make it happen. He was the biggest proponent of let's try it or yeah. let's at least explore the ideas. And if it's because of some reason, liability or whatever, that we really research and check out the answers and the those things, then, OK, what else? What's next? But, Got it. Said, but here they were shutting down their own ideas for something they really valued and wanted and would make a difference and would be, you know, a win-win in many ways. So It's funny. I have that with my kids sometimes. They'll come to me and they're shutting down their idea while they're asking for it. You know, maybe they want to go, maybe they want to go to play their Xbox and they're like, hey, dad, I was thinking, but you probably won't want to, but I was wondering, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, what? Just ask me the question. Don't, don't tell me that I'm not going to answer it first. They're like, do you want to play Xbox with me? I'm like, they're setting, sure. they're setting it up. Oh my yeah. God. But so, I see that with employees too. Yeah. So you have to think, where did they learn that? Yeah. How do you pivot that? Yeah. How do you get, how, how do you create the, their, their, what, something they want? They need to see that. This is they want, and how are they going to get it? So teaching them strategy, right? And yeah. this is one thing I want to share since now I know you're a parent. How many children? Uh, three. What are the ages? I've got an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 5-year-old. So we're right in the midst of negotiation. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay. Um, there is an author, uh -huh. and it's going to become your best friend. Right. <laughs> His name is Alfie Cohn, A-L-F-I-E-K-O-H-N. Okay. He's got powerful books. If you think I'm a transformational thinker, you see nothing yet. Right. And he wrote a book, um, No Contest, The Case Against Competition. Oh, wow. And then he's written books about the myth about homework, which I absolutely buy into. And I remember yeah. when I was on my high school journalism team, I wrote an op-ed for the school newspaper against homework. And, um, but his, the one I really like is punished by rewards. This is the case against gold stars and grades uh -huh. and incentives there. It's for parents it's for yeah. leaders, and I've taught MBA classes at six different universities, and sometimes I'm a guest speaker at different universities. And when I when I have my class, I, the first evening, I tell them, if you do these things, everyone gets an A. 
And sometimes it takes them a little while to believe me. Uh -huh. But then I say, okay, now that we're setting the grade aside, what are we going to focus on? And I still remember this manager from Intel uh -huh. quietly saying, learning? I said, yes, let's focus on learning. And secondly, you can all put your computers away. We're not going to use them here because right. we're going to focus on learning. I've been a guest speaker before where, you know, they want to just take the notes. notes so notes. all I see are the tops of the heads, which yeah. makes me crazy because yeah, I want to engage. So it's like you can put those away because we're going to have robust conversations. We're going to ask tough questions. We're going to think differently. And I, I know that a lot of the teams focus on projects and, and uh, gathering the analytical data, and they can bury themselves because mm -hmm. they're doing too much. They're looking at way too much, way too many measures, um, and and they need to step back and start with what question are we trying to answer? Yeah. Who are we trying to serve? Who are the customers? What are the markets? What do they care about? What do they value? When I think about calling, a, I'll say, a telephone company or a cable company or one of those, uh, an airline where I get yep. stuck on hold and yep. I'm routed and rerouted and they won't give me a live agent, they I'm supposed to do everything now with the I don't know if it's a, a bot or what it is, but let me tell you that my questions, they don't have answers for. So I <laughs> want a person. Me too. But, um, but this, but I, so I use with all the teams, a strategic compass. It's in my book and it's on my website uh -huh. because I tell whether it's an executive team, a process improvement team, a project team, if you use this as your template, these five basic questions, you can run a billion dollar company or you can run a small team of eight people, Yeah, but it will help you focus and answer the right questions. That's uh, exciting because it's funny, you and I were talking about this before the show about when I first came into this job and I had 37 priority initiatives that I wanted to run out in the business because you go and do your balance scorecard and you're like, right. We want to improve margin in these accounts. We want to expand into this territory. We want to build out a better onboarding process for this talent. We want to build out a better training. And you come up with these 37 things and then the team's sitting there going, oh my gosh, in what order should we do this? How are we ever going to have the resource to get there? What if it changes by the time we finally get that thing done? I mean, it's, it's a yeah. challenge. Okay. You do all that in, I would call analytical work. Yeah. And you're answering the wrong question. Yeah. And so you're so deep in it, you don't see that what are we trying to accomplish that's that where we can support each other and serve customers. What do the customers care about? Yeah. What is what are their what's their what what are their values what do, what do they consider quality you know when you go to a restaurant mm -hmm. you know what's important if you want to go you know out to dinner for a romantic evening those qualities are going to be different than taking the three kids to their favorite fast food or to wherever they like to go yeah so that's that's where you start you um many 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 times for decades I ask the teams, whether executive team, process improvement team, start your conversation yep. about quality. Uh huh. Start there so that everything you're discussing, you're focusing on, makes a difference to each other, how you support each other, and how you serve your customers, whether it's, whether it be patients, whether it be students, yeah. whether it be constituents, the system, the system delivers and the system can only deliver 
if all of the parts of the system are working together. Yeah. So when you think about a bicycle, when you think about a school system, you think about an, a, a, a corporation, all of the parts have to work together. And one important thing that Dr. Deming taught in Japan, so to summarize, get rid of the org chart. This is a, a, um, a real twist for HR people yeah. too. But, but you, can, you can have an org chart stuck in a file or something that only shows who reports to who so that, okay, if I report to you, and I went a week off for vacation. Who do I go to sure. to discuss, is this week okay? So that's for the purpose of the org chart. But if you want to lead a healthy, sustainable organization, you don't use an org chart. You use a system diagram. Uh -uh. And you create a system diagram. And the purpose of that is to connect the dots, show how... Everything else relates to everything else. It's like a relationship diagram. And, yeah. then, and then draw the arrows. And that also helps you see if you've got a part or many parts that have a lot of arrows, bingo, that's where your complexity and waste is. That's yeah. where you need to free the up bottleneck. Those, those bottlenecks in yeah. order to, I just got a new book. I don't know where it is. It's, um, I think, called Flow, and it's a workflow, and it's written or put together by uh, Dr. Goldratt's right. daughter. And, of course, that's the first book, actually, that I recommend to all of my clients is the book The Goal, a fiction book. Goal uh -huh. been out for more than 30 years. It is the first most powerful book that people can read or listen to if it's audible. Um, there's a yeah. movie um, you can, you can, you can buy or rent the video, but make sure that it's not the 20 minute version. Cause you won't get anything out of it. It's gotta be at least the 45 minute version. Okay. I'll make a note of that and we'll put that up with the show notes. Well, this has been a great conversation, Marsha. We've touched on so many good things. I'm looking at my my notes here, um, I love the way that you stripped in power from my vocabulary. Um, I love that challenge. Uh, this, this concept about um, being open and committed to learning and then being courageous for leaders that are really looking to unlock the potential of their teams is huge. Um, and I really, really like this, this whole statement around uh, starting with quality because the quality allows you to think about not only how you serve your customer, but how your team members serve each other in the operation of the business. Yes. Um, so, so that is cool. And, and the system diagram versus the org chart. I, I did w read a quote once that said, a bad system beats a good person every day. And that, that really rocked me at first because I'm, I'm a humanist first. I'm all about the value and power of people rather than systems and technology. But the reality is going to your system diagram if you look at how the system works, you can find a way for more people to work better together. And it, you're not having an organization that's relying on these key people who, who are bottlenecks. Yes. So, and, the, and, and the role of leadership is to create and optimize and transform the system. In like one sentence, that's the role of leadership. It. And then develop the, develop the people. And um, Don Peterson who was the CEO, now retired CEO and chairman of Ford Motor, said, everything we do, we do through people. Yeah. No, I love that. Yes. I love that. So you can use the technology to support people, but it's still the people that do the real horsepower. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm not huge on technology stuff, and I use it probably way too much. I mean, my iPhone is my little buddy. And I don't go anywhere without it. But otherwise, it's like, I'm, I, th I think I'm definitely more about the relationship. I, I'm not me dependent, too. dependent on the... No, me too. God. Well, well, for any of our listeners that want to reach out and learn more about working with uh, your consultancy or, or the book, how do they best find you, Marsha? Um, I'm my, my website is mdashko.com, so uh -huh. they can come through that. My phone number is 
uh-huh. 398-7220. I'm on Great. LinkedIn. A, a LinkedIn message is a fast way to also reach me. Please subscribe for my newsletter because I put that out every week. I write a weekly column for the Silicon Valley Business Journal called Ask Marsha. It's a leadership Q&A. Anybody cool. can ask me a leadership question. And I answer it in that column. It's kind of like the Dear Abby of leadership. Yeah. And um, and the book is available on Amazon um, through Barnes and Noble and so forth. I was excited one day when it first came out, and I I walked into uh, Barnes and Noble on Fifth Avenue in New York City, and my book was there. Oh, that's cool. That's got to be a buzz. That's got to yeah, be a buzz. Well, a- I'm definitely going to go and grab a copy. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and. Uh, we're going to keep talking about that next book uh, per right. our conversation before. Yeah, the show. definitely yeah. that. And now you've got your homework to do to to explore Alfie Cohn's Punished by Regret. I do. My, I'm going to call my wife and tell her that's on our next reading list. Yeah, because no more bribing the kids. Uh, if you no. stop crying in the grocery store, I'll get you a candy bar. Oh, yeah. No more of that. No, you're encouraging the wrong stuff. Well, thank <laughs> you, Marsha. I've had a great Thank time you. and we'll talk soon. 